Mm. Right. So a pleasant good morning again. Welcome. This is of course uh, Trinidad and Guyana students here. Um, but if anyone is looking at this on the YouTube channel, of course, uh, so welcome to this session. This is the NIBOSH um, Environmental Awareness and Work uh, Qualification. Um, of course, that is assessed with uh, a multiple choice exam uh, from NIBOSH. And NIBOSH would, of course, send the date for that once we are officially finished. We could apply for the exam. So there have been other parts of this on YouTube, and you all have had it on the WhatsApp group for those of us who are here. So I'll take it off from right here, right? Um, so types of air pollution, we have uh, particulates and what well, different forms of particulates, right? So we have smoke, dust, grit, fumes, fiber. Another type of air pollution is gases. Another type of air pollution falls under the category of vapors. Another type of air pollution falls under the category of mist, right? And so just to keep on the reading going here, uh, if there's anything you want to add in, yeah, okay, you can just let me just I'm getting mics. It's just about four or five of you all anyway. Well, two for now, right? I haven't seen uh Nikisia and um and what Anne told me she had some trouble coming in, right? Uh, and so uh if you put something in the chat, it's gonna slow me down. Just kind of uh just on the mic and just let me know if you have any concerns, right? So um types of air pollution, odor is used in relation to the types of air pollution. Pollutants may be released deliberately, example, via chimney, accidentally, example, via leaks in, in pipe work or in a pipe work. Um, unplanned releases are sometimes referred to as fugitive emissions. Let's keep your mind on that one. That one is a passive question. In fact, this one slide has two passive questions, but let me try to finish up this and maybe we could, you know, come back to those two questions, right? So in 1984, um, a union carbide corporation factory manufacturing pesticides in Bhopal in India leaked around 30 tons of toxic gas into the atmosphere. The leak was caused by a process failure when water accidentally penetrated a tank holding the toxic chemical metal isocyanates. The resultant chemical reaction caused the temperature and pressure in the tank to rise drastically and toxic gas was vented through a pressure relief valve. The toxic gas drifted over local residential area, causing deaths and serious injuries. Estimates vary, and it still does vary. Um, but it's thought that around 8,000 people died and over 30,000 suffered serious severe injury within weeks of the uh, incident occurring. So the control of air pollution, what is the best way of achieving this? They say eliminate, minimize, render harmless. Again, you may want to learn that. Remember with the uh, DeBosch multiple choice, is not an open book. You do have to learn these things. And uh, that would be something to learn, right? Uh, and, and so there's not too much of emphasis. Well, I am not emphasizing too much on participants today, but I just tell it to learn, right? Uh, and and you, you, you would learn it, of course. Control of air pollution. Think about a car. An obvious way to save energy and reduce emissions is to use it less. Riding a bicycle to the shop might be an alternative, and they have lots of that around the world. Uh, London and Singapore and uh, Scotland and stuff have lots of alternatives to use uh, different modes of transportation. Bicycle, a, a, a normal bicycle being one, um, of course, Guyana has lots of that is very common across there. Um, uh, motorcycles and, and electric, you know, cycles and whatever have you, right? So over the longer term, Lasting improvements in the fuel efficiency of cars have been achieved through research and development by the motor industry. Um, control equipment cleans, exhausts, and dirty air before release. Uh, we have here objective, the removal of grit, larger particles, and water droplets. The treatment is gravity separators and cyclones. Removal of small, particul oh, small particulates. We have fabric or bag filters. Removal of fine particulate water droplets, electrostatic precipitators, removal of particulate gases, wet scrubbers, removal of vapor gases, adsorption. So again, this is something for you to learn. And that's what I'm saying today. And, and you have, I'm not going to emphasize it any more than that. Right? That's something for you to learn. I have seen a question on this one. I'll just tell you, I'm not going to emphasize too much on it. Um, the ask what was the best treatment for the removal of small particles? The, the answer would have been fabric or bag filters, 
right? Uh, effects of air pollution, the Earth's atmosphere is a global system. Contaminants released can cause three levels of pollution, local, regional, and global. We have such as in element one already. The local effects, uh, vehicle exhaust emissions are a great contributor to smog. Um, ground level ozone damages vegetation. Particularly, poor air quality in London in 1952 is estimated to have contributed to the early deaths of around 4,000 people and resulted in over 20,000 illnesses. And we have had this in the Caribbean too, uh, places like Montserrat, uh, wherever you have serious um, sort of uh, fires, right? Like, uh, for, like for those in Guyana, we have Ijaz here, which is in Trinidad, but we do have um, getting into the city of uh, Port of Spain, which is the main city in Trinidad. There is like a... a well, along the highway there, so the highway getting into the city, kind of like, you know, of course, I didn't quite notice that in, in Georgetown, like getting into Georgetown, it's a nice, cool highway, right? And of course, you see the big signs, the big arch, you know, saying welcome to Georgetown. But getting into Port of Spain is not the same, right? Getting into Port of Spain, it, it, it is via a highway, on I guess, on either side, right? And either of the two main points of entry into Port of Spain, right? But one of them... Uh, like along the highway, I want to say along, it's not really on the highway itself, but like parallel to the highway there, there's a huge uh, dump, it's like the main dump for, I guess, North Trinidad, right? They, they call it the Beatum. And of course, a lot of uh, crime and stuff has happened there if, if you have been in tune with, I guess, Trinidad music or what they call Trinidad music, you know, you'll have an idea of what I'm talking about. But along that 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 highway there, you know, just parallel to it, just I think you can actually see it just parallel to it. It's like a huge dump. And when that is on fire, we do get very bad emissions in Port of Spain. And the effect lasts for days and if not, if not probably probably about a week or so, unless they kind of get the fire under control. Right? But it is it, it is it has all of the particulates you could think about because remember it's a dump, there would be metallic stuff, there are plastic stuff that is burning. And um what what the companies in Port of Spain normally have to do is sort of close down, have their workers, you know, work at home. It is it is highly hazardous then, right? The, the atmosphere is highly hazardous. The whole city, of course, they would have been front page of the papers and stuff that is covered in smog, right? And so it's it's kind of horrible, you know, based on where that dump is located as it is on the way to the capital city of Trinidad anyway. I'm not to sure if anything is similar like that in Georgetown. At least I didn't notice it. I didn't notice anything like that, like, you know, getting into the capital city of Georgetown, right? Um, so the effects of air pollution could be, so that would be local effect, like when I talk about, you know, like the smog. Regional effects, oxide of nitrogen and sulfur can react with moisture or water to make acid rain damaging trees, soil, lakes and other ecosystems, right? I just leave that as is, uh, you know, some gases are soluble, they dissolve in water. I can show you all of that, but I wouldn't waste the time. I, I think it's a bit too much, right? Like the chemical equation that you can have uh, like um, H2SO4, you know, dissolving in water or hydrogen or sulfur. Sulfur reacting with water to form H2S, right? And, and H2S can react again to form H2SO4 which is actually sulfuric acid, right? So it is thought that around 20,000 lakes in Scandinavia have been affected by acid rain, with 4,000 being so acidic that no life can survive in them. Regional effect, acid rain can also lead to structural damage. Dust and particulate matter can be transported over hundreds of kilometers. The indiscriminate burning of rainforests in Indonesia have created episodes of severe air pollution in Singapore. Now, we have seen some of that, if, if you have been around on YouTube and stuff, right? Where smoke and debris from the fires caused a thick haze over the city, lasting many weeks during 2013. And uh, like I said, we have had it in Port of Spain. And, you know, whenever we have one of those volcanoes acting up, all of that was all over YouTube as well. Um, You know, you would see it anyway, right? Hmm. I have somebody joining up, but I don't know the person. I, I, so we have some other classes on today. I hope I'll have to ask them to identify themselves, right? Um, I guess I'll come back to that, right? So global effects, um, 
climate change and ozone depletion are now the top of the international agenda. Uh, some of this I mentioned here last week. Um, uh, this is actually two sort of separate things, but I guess they work hand in hand. I don't know if I'm just a dude over here for you. Um, but it's two separate things, right? So like um, global warming is not the same as ozone depletion, right? I prefer to do it on my own diagram, right? But um, like what you're seeing here, this may be actually more global warming than anything about. So like the sun rays enter through the earth, we call it UVB radiation. And normally they would leave, right? So normally like the sun rays hit the surface of the earth and then it leaves, right? But what would they say? Because of the increased use of, uh, you know, like, uh, or the increased industrialization, they have been an extra layer of gas. Anybody remember the name of that gas? What was the main gas responsible for? Global warming, not ozone depletion. So I, I guess we could ask Alvin parents and just identify yourself. Uh, like, like, are you one of our students or are you in another class and you're joining here by mistake? Sam is Anne, sorry. Okay, it's Anne. Okay, no problem. Okay. All right, yeah. Okay, so anybody remember the main gas responsible for global warming? So that's what's happening here. This is happening global warming, right? Uh, what was the main gas responsible for global warming? So the gas is CO2, right? Good old-fashioned CO2, the increase in carbon dioxide due to industrialization. So what you see is that the increase in CO2 have caused a layer. Now it's not ozone depletion. I'll do ozone depletion in the next slide. If you want, I could do it on this one. But it's two separate things, and I could do it here. You know? I could do it here, right? So you see global warming. You could probably put out here global warming. The main gas is CO2. And global warming is not ozone depletion, right? Try not to slow down too much today, right? But I have to, I guess, because this is a passive question. What is the main gas responsible for global warming? And it's CO2. So what is ozone depletion? Well, there's another layer of gases up there, and that's ozone, right? Now, ozone is actually three molecules of oxygen. Yeah, the, you know, like the air have oxygen. So O2 is oxygen, but sometimes that O2 reacts with just another molecule and it gets to O3, and that is what they call ozone, right? So in the stratosphere, there's like a layer of oxygen. So when they say a layer of gases, right, they say ozone. It's like the good old-fashioned oxygen in it, but it is just bonded with another molecule of oxygen to form O3. And what that does, though, that layer, it actually prevents, like, um, some of the harmful radiation. Of course, the sun is there, but, I, I mean, the sun would have been higher, up, right? I'd probably draw this a bit too high. But so that, that layer of oxygen, O3, is responsible now for filtering out harmful UVB radiation, right? So that's what they refer to as the ozone layer. It's just a layer of oxygen up there that sort of prevents harmful, um, you know, like uh, radiation from coming in in the first place, right? So that's why I say they kind of work together, right? Like these two concepts are kind of together, but it's still separate. Like the gas responsible for global warming is actually CO2. And then let's see what is responsible now for ozone depletion. So I kind of jump in ahead here, but there's a nice, I'll do it here and I'll, I'll write it here so that because it is a question, these two things are questions. So what is responsible for ozone depletion is actually chlorine or chloride, if, if you really call it the iron, right? Well, this is how they say it, I-O-N. When you strip chlorine, then or when we say not when we strip it, but we can strip it in the process of electrolysis. Um, you know, it like when you strip chloride, which is Cl2, it forms into the ion, I-O-N, that's what they refer to that in chemistry. And chloride is the name of it, the chloride ion. What that does is it, it, it really eats away at the O3, right? So any compound that have, you know, like CFCs, right? So CFCs is chlorofluorohydrocarbons, right? Emphasis the, on the chloro, right? So the chloro is telling you that CFCs have chlorine in it, right? So actually the gas responsible for the depletion of the ozone layer is not CO2, but it's chloride ion. So that's all right, it's here for you, right? And what the chloride ion does do, or what that chlorine does do, right? It eats at the ozone, and then it eats another one. And then it eats another one, right? It doesn't go away. It's like plastic. You know, plastic doesn't really go away, right? So it, it eats and it just keeps on eating. People have described it to be like the Pac-Man. It, it's like Pac-Man, right? It just eats the 
ozone layer, and that's what they call ozone depletion. Long, long story, but of course, the, 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 the hole over the ozone layer, sorry, the, the hole over the Antarctic was discovered, you know, like way in the 1970s by two British uh, scientists. Uh, the name of those persons was Roland. Uh, kind of person so that anybody could write it up, Roland and Molina, right? They were given the Nobel Peace Prize for that discovery that they have realized that there's a hole, there's a, there's a section of missing gases over Antarctica. Now, from then to now, they, they, like even though they have banned CFC compounds, what you need to know is that Pac-Man is still out there, right? So there's no stopping it then. There's no stopping the depletion of the ozone layer. Don't know if you understand that, right? They have to find a way to extract that gas from there. And many creative persons like J Jeff Bezos and, you know, um, you know, uh, have, have proposed different ideas to sort of, uh, you know, to build back the gases in the ozone layer, maybe to pump in CO, sorry, O3 molecules back in there, right? Uh, some way to kind of get rid of that gas. But once it's there, even though they have stopped the CFCs, right? Like in your deodorants and stuff, it's still there and it's still eaten. That's what it does, right? It eats and it eats. And I think they have said now, initially the whole over the ozone, the whole, sorry, over Antarctica was just over where the scientists had found. But now it's about the size of Antarctica. And some people say it's about the size of South America, which is huge, right? Anyway, um, I, I think there's a lot of money and I think there's a lot of ideas for the next generation maybe i i have a way to stop it though so i probably have to trademark that idea well, i wouldn't say it here right and uh, there, have, there have been a lot of ideas to to you know like to replenish or maybe to get rid of that gases or to put a substitute layer up there that could actually get rid of the harmful uvb radiation anyway right but please write it down i'm moving on because i told you a little bit more there than you should know Right. And uh, this story goes way, 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 way back, you know, in terms of, um, you know, like uh, changes to the planet then. Right. And, and what has been happening, you know, I guess over centuries anyway. Right. Any questions there on that? I'm moving on. I'm going to take all of it off. Hopefully you, you write this on and you're learning. I can't do better than that at the moment because, you know, writing it on and telling you. Sorry, 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 just before you go. The, yeah. Oh, you just take it off. Okay, what was the IOA you said um, stands for? Well, it doesn't stand for anything. That's just how they pronounce it. Ion, I-O-N-S, ion. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, okay. that's just how they, they pronounce it. Like if you take a molecule, okay, if you have water, right? That's supposed to be I-O-N, right? Or ions, right? If you have water, right? So like water, we all know that one. Water is H2O. Yeah, so water is H2O. But if you strip that then, and there are ways you can do it, like the process of electrolysis, like how they... Like if you're gonna, you know, like chrome, well, like chrome, a piece of metal, chrome like a bicycle handle, right? How they electrolyze, um, you know, like uh, gold, right? What we call fashion jewelry and stuff. So what they do, they'll have to put the solution in water and they run electricity through it. Like if you're chroming a chain, then you're chroming a chain with, with what we call real gold or fashion gold, right? So they will put the gold solution in water, right? Gold is AG. The symbol for gold is AG. But when you run the electricity to it, through that solution of gold and water, the chain that you want to electrolyze, they will dip that into the solution. It's actually attached to something called an electrode, which is actually a lead. It's actually lead from, like how we have a lead pencil. Mm -hmm. So they attach yeah. the gold to the lead, right? And anyway, long story short, the, 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 the current, when it strips the water, when you strip water, you get H2O. Right, so you get H and another H. That's why they call it H two O because it's two H's and oxygen. Right now, okay. when you strip yeah. it, so they refer to this as a molecule. But when you strip it, they refer to this as an ion. So this is the ion of hydrogen, the ion of hydrogen, and the ion of oxygen. That's what they call it. So like when you strip chlorine, that's what I was trying to say. When you strip chlorine, you get chloride ion Cl minus, and each one of this is the monster. This is the Pac-Man monster that keeps eating at the ozone layer. Yeah. And it's called chloride iron. Yeah. See? Yeah. Everything I thought chemistry, right? All right. Good. I got that part. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I used to teach chemistry. I was happy assessed by the ministry to teach chemistry. I did teach chemistry in a secondary school, but that was early in my career. Like, just about 
straight out of school, straight, straight out of school, long story short. My, chem my chemistry teacher, when I came and I collected my eleven result, my chemistry teacher told me if I wanted to teach, I was like, you know, I was just got, I would just collect my eleven results in my hand, which is GC levels, right? And I was like, yeah, sure, I want to teach chemistry. And that, and that was the end of that. But the next week, I didn't know how the principal had done it, but the next week I was teaching chemistry in the school. <laughs> Straight, I, I, I don't think I was 19 years, I was 18 years, right? People who were in my class, who had to repeat chemistry, came back and sat back in my class. And we were classmates together in form six. That's such a, such a weird experience. Anyway, climate change, right? So there's little doubt global warming. And rising CO2 levels, so look at here, are linked through the greenhouse effect. So if they tell it was the main gas responsible for global warming, you can't miss it. I wrote it on the slide. Look at here. Global warming, greenhouse effect, CO2. Some radiation is absorbed by greenhouse gases. Man-made emissions are believed to enhance the greenhouse effect. Well, yes, because we are highly industrialized, right? Food producing areas might begin to suffer droughts. There are places around the world you see that, like India. Uh, they are also likely to be more extreme and disruptive weather events. Well, we are seeing that all over the world, right? Uh, storms, floods, I've, I've seen it even, like every year, this time of the year, this is July, August, right? But um, up to recently, I was watching something in Venice, like, like two days ago. And then I was watching something in Texas, I think, have a whole set of floods as well, right? Ozone depletion. So the ozone layer absorbs some UV, where is UVB radiation from the sun? Ozone depletion is caused by emissions containing CFCs, halons. Keep your mind on what is a beast. Like the beast in this is chloride, right? Carbon tetrachloride. I'll show you that one. Metal chloroform. Chlorofluorohydrocarbons. The emphasis there. Well, halons are actually belong to the same category of um, in the periodic table in chemistry. It belongs to the same category of uh, chlorine anyway. The Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete ozone layers would have listed Chloride, again, I can tell you some of these things. It, it, like you just need one, but carbon tetrachloride, that's four. That's tetra is four, right? Carbon tetrachloride is four molecules of chlorine out there, right? Carbon tetrachloride, this is how you draw it. Four molecules of chlorine, and each one of them is a Pac Man. And even if you, I tell you, yes, they stopped using it late in the 1980s. Uh, you know, late in the uh the, the 1990s, the beast of this thing is still out there, right? It, it is a Pac-Man. It eats uh, the, each one of this eats and it, it eats another one. And eats, uh, it doesn't go away. It's not going away, right? Unless we find a way to get them out of there, right? And I said, um, a lot of emphasis, a lot of creative ideas have been put forward. I will tend to copyright mine in years to come, right? I'm moving on, right? Um. Just to show you, but the key emphasis here is chlorine, 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 chlorine. That's why if they ask you which is the main gas, don't, don't put CO2. What is ozone depletion? It's chloride iron, right? Or chlorine. Anything with chlorine, you see, well, then that's the answer for the uh for the question. I'm just trying to set up this thing here, right? All right, uh, let's try to go again. So uh, let's see, the most important source of air pollution in the world is what? Uh, waste incineration, air travel, destroying tropical forests, burning fossil fuels, right? Um, which one do you think it is? Now, the answers to these things are in the book. Um, let me try to see if we can find that. I if think I it's uh, burning fossil fuels. I think it's burning fossil fuels too, right? Um, remember, you have a little book. Uh, yeah, look at here. This is page 49. I don't know if they give us the answer. Uh, the question is there, page 49 in, in your book. Um, I think some, somewhere in this book have the answers in it. Right? But I, I, I know it's D, right? I just, I'm trying to help you now. So like, if you ever come across another question, like, have they published the answer elsewhere? I haven't seen it, right? I didn't see it. Normally they publish it on the other page. Maybe it's the back or something. If not, I tell you, it's D one time. But should you be revising? Um, you know, I I would want to. I would have guessed they put the answer somewhere, but at the moment, I can't seem to find it. Right? So maybe it's there. Maybe you can look around see if it's there. But the answer is D, right? But in fossil fuel. All right. Next one. Sources of water pollution include domestic waste waters, industrial discharge, unplanned discharges, agriculture. 
I almost thought I was in Grenada there, right? Green, Green, <laughs> Grenada have like how, you know, Trinidad has um what we call doubles, right? Um, Guyana has, you know, chicken curry. And other things, of course, pepper pot and stuff, right? <laughs> but Grenada have something called waters. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like a street food, right? All right, domestic waste waters. So sewage, the greatest potential source of water pollution throughout the world is sewage. And that is a possible question right there. So like they will ask, so like which one is the greatest source of water pollution? The answer is actually the one with sewage, right? Almost all UK sewage sewages is treated to international standards, not throughout the Caribbean. They have made an effort. I'll, I'll tell you one just now, right? Domestic waste in many developing countries is discharged untreated. Domestic waste of many developing countries is discharged untreated, which is a major source of water pollution, right? Um, so let's read on a bit. So industrial discharges, industries generate liquid effluent. Effluent is the runoff as a byproduct, discharging them into the sewer system. Local waters. They also discharge cooler waters for electricity generation, oil refining, steel making, cement manufacture. So there are laws for this around the world. Um, the UK, Canada, America, Trinidad have laws for this, right? We have an environmental management authority that you have to, if you if you have factored and then you're given off an emission, in, in this case, an effluent, right, which is water based. But also emissions is the air, right? So water or air, you have set limits to meet them, right? They will have testing. We have environmental officers. We have uh, an environmental agency. We have labs and stuff that do this thing. And you have to discharge within a set limit. Now, what I know, I probably shouldn't say that, but what, what my experience have been doing is that you are still putting out a contaminant then, right? So even if there is a limit, let's say a safe limit, that doesn't mean that it's not put on all the contaminant, right? So like, who is to say, so they have done their testing, right? Um, so who is to say the amount of lead or whatever, right? When they say a safe limit, like, is it really safe for all organisms? And then if it's something like lead or mercury that tends to bioaccumulate, right? Or maybe some other agents, but I'm just calling the ones on the top of my head, right? Um, you know, like, uh, who is to say then that if, if let's just say the limit is 0.1 or 0 0.00001, right? Who is to say that is safe for all organisms, right? It, so the the environmental management authorities, they would regulate the, the effluent, but to a limit. And there's always susceptibility. There's always some organism out there that still is susceptible, right? So it may be safer for some organisms, including man, well, well, what about that one organism that, that is susceptible and then that now gets eaten? Let's just say it's some sort of crab, right? Some sort of mussel, some sort of mollusk, right? That gets eaten by a crab and then that crabs get eaten by a fish and then that fish get eaten by a bigger fish. And what we were talking about here was mercury, that same 0, 0 0.1. But things tend to bioaccumulate, meaning from organisms to organism it builds up the toxicity there. Then that large fish gets eaten by a salmon and then that salmon gets eaten by a kingfish. And then that kingfish now gets caught by a, a fisherman and sells it on the market. Ends up in your plate and a restaurant, right? So the idea with this, like my experience have been, and I'll, I, there's so much to tell you, but I can't tell you all, right? I've been, like I said, with, for those of us who know Trinidad, we have the IME, which is the Institute of Marine Affairs. I've been there many times and, I've actually known the head of that institute and, and I've actually heard from him that the contaminants, they're still out there. Like and this, this talk I'm telling is not really for me, it's really from him saying that uh, the, the contaminants doesn't, the contaminant limit doesn't mean like it's not putting out a contaminant. And then, you know, um, you know, so I had, I'd ask him, right? I'd ask him, so, so why don't you all say something more? Well, of course, you know, Trinidad, I mean, these things be just be part of our regulation. And they are fines and things for the company, right? But of course, big companies, a fine of 10,000 TT, which is about, I guess, 300,000 Guyanese, may not really be a big thing for them. It may be a fine, but if you're a manufacturing company, then you're making that money, right? Anyway, the long and short of it, if, if I can tell you the end of it, 
the head of the IME, which is the Institute of Marine Affairs, uh, when when like when I'd ask him that question, folks are telling you how it how it happened. I'm not I'm not putting any, you know, juju on it. I just telling you how it happened, right? So like when I asked him that question, he didn't answer. I didn't. I said like, why didn't you inform the the public about this? And we were kind of talking about you know um, uh, you know like um, I trying to remember, but but things like you know what like what you all call um. Uh, the 40 body gone oil, you know what I'm talking about? That sort of mixture of um, somebody help me with this, like with mollusk and, you know, you, they actually have it down at the seawall in Guyana. We have it in Trinidad to various places in Trinidad will sell it, right? Um, you know, so what, like, what, like what he was saying was that because of the oil, the, the um, somebody help me with it now, what's your proper name of it? Um, uh, oysters, is it what you call oysters? Like the oysters mixed it that you all have. I think they call it 40 body gun oil, gun oil or gun oil in, uh, in Guyana. Um, you know, so so like so like that oysters, he was saying it, it, it that nobody should be eating it there, right? Because the level of contaminants is so much. You can eat it probably somewhere else, but then you see Guyana have oil now, right? But you can eat it somewhere else, like in another Caribbean country, or maybe somewhere else that the water doesn't have oil in it, right? Anyway, I was telling him what, what, what he told me was nothing. When I asked him the question, what he did, he rocked back on his chair and he showed me two pitiers. He had two pitiers on his table. He just turned the pitiers towards me, which was um, two, two pitiers of his kids, right? And uh, I mean, you, you could interpret that to how you want to interpret it, but the way I interpreted it was that he have children to see about. He have kids to see about. So, like, he wouldn't really upset the, like the system that there is there now. You know, like putting out some sort of warning about oysters and 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 stuff like in the Trinidad waters anyway, right? He just showed me his two kids, and he turned back the pit to himself, and that was the end of that, right? Anyway, um, so industrial. Sorry, industries generate liquid effluent as a byproduct, discharging them into the sewer system, local waters. So we went through that already. And the fact is, I said, it does have a contaminant in it, right? If there is a spill, we have a source of contaminant. Remember, the source pathway receptor model. Is there a pathway by which the contaminant can reach a sensitive receptor? What if that sensitive receptor is you? Unplanned discharges, right? If a spill of oil occurs near an open drain, it might get into the drainage system, the pathway, and eventually reach the local river, which is the receptor. Spills that happen on unmade ground may contaminate the, the surroundings. So unmade ground is like, you know, like, um, but in natural earth there, right? So it penetrates through the earth, right? But contaminate the surrounding land and pass into the ground water. Do you think there's any risk of spills of hazardous liquids at your place of work? What liquids might that involve? And you could think of that based on your company, right? Agriculture. Incidents usually involve unplanned release of contaminants. Runoff fertilizers and pesticide is most significant, right? So an unplanned release. Like, again, the reason why I stop is because this one too is a passive. But unplanned releases of contaminants could happen from the runoff of fertilizers, right? So the farmers will apply fertilizers uh, fertilizers not normally contain nitrogen, potassium, NPK, and phosphorus, right? But then what if you have a, like, I mean, when rainfall and then that seeps into the soil, seeps into the water table, gets into the rivers, gets into the stream, we'll see what's going to happen next, right? So that is called an unplanned release. So agriculture, fertilizers, especially nitrates, applied in crops at the wrong time of the year, can leach off the land, can get into the drainage system, and can enter rivers. This is known as a diffuse source of pollution. It does not enter the river via a distinct point source because it does seep into the land. It diffuses now back into the water course. Take note of all of these terms. All of these are questions, right? They can give it that same thing. They say nitrates or fertilizers seep into the soil and gets into the water system. Which best describes that? It's known as a diffuse source of pollution. So you have to start your studies, right? Reminder. The hierarchy of approach for controlling pollution is first of all, eliminate, minimize, or try to render them harmless. If we eliminate the source of contaminant, it can't cause pollution. If we minimize our water consumption, we reduce the wastewater to be disposed of. 
if discharges can be eliminated or minimized, they need to be rendered harmless. Think of the opportunities that the organization might have to save water. Try to write down at least three of these ideas. Well, for Guyana, uh, you all may not know this, and I, you know, I have realized this, but there's no real sort of shortage of water in Guyana. But on the island of Trinidad, we have massive water shortages, right? And that's strange because we are an island, right? And what is even more strange, if, if, if anybody listening to this on the worldwide platform, we actually have a desalination plant. So we have water, we have springs, we have waterfalls, we have dams. Um, we are surrounded by water. Trinidad is a small island. And we also have a desalination plant, right? I do work for them. And in spite of all of that, we don't have a constant water supply. If we get water in our tank, in our taps, it's just like for one or two days, just to fill up your tanks. So to really put on a tap in Trinidad and get water, which is, I mean, like, like from the water authority and not from your tanks, because it comes once or twice for the week. So your tanks are filled, right? So you get it from your tanks and your pump, but ready to like the day that you get in, in your tap, you know you're kind of blessed. That's the way to say it. Because you know then, okay, well, like that's the day to wash, that's the day to clean. That's how it is on the island, right? And when I was in Guyana, I, I was with, of course, a taxi driver. And, and, and so I asked him, I said, so you, like, like, you all have any issues for water? And he said, no, he said, he said, well, Guyana is strongly with water. And I said, well, well, so are we. We are strongly with water, too. We are both an island. I mean, you all are a continent, right? But he said, you all don't really have a water issue on, you know, in Guyana. Anyway, I don't know if it's different for different parts of Guyana. We have a couple of students who could probably speak to that. But like I said, the reality of living in Trinidad is you don't get water in your taps. The day you get, like like today it has. So I know it has today. That's why I'm talking about it. I know it has today. But then that's not Just something you should... Physically just, to shed some light, just to shed some light on that part of the water um, distribution here, we don't have shortages while we get our water sources for domestic uses. Um, there are some artesian wells that is around in the country, many wells. Um, yeah. But the main source of distribution through the water company, which is um, GWI, that comes from the Lamaha Canal, which they put through a process in the plant and then do distribution to the various communities. In some community where that canal does not um, support, there are wells that they have dug and they've been getting um, water supply. Rarely we will have shortage of water um, coming from your taps. Um, and that more will be like if there is a problem with the pumps, or some sort of electricity issues causing us not to get water, or if there is a breakage in the water uh, line somewhere, they're doing some maintenance work, or generally, you know, some some, some weird person, I guess, you know, break the well, they, the lines or something, and that will cause some sort of disruption. But it's not something that is uh, uh, present in our communities or society. Yeah. Thanks very much. That's the same sentiment that the taxi, the same thing as the taxi driver had told me. It's only if, if like there's a breakage in the line or something then. And like, like folks, I remember to tell you how this is a serious issue in Trinidad. It has to do with management. We don't really have to do with the availability of water. You know? Remember, we're an island. We have a desalination plant and it has springs and it has artesian wells and it has waterfalls and stuff. It's a matter of management anyway. But this is something, if you come to Trinidad, this is what I'm telling you, if you come here, this is something that will stand out to you, that you put on the taps, and if you don't have a pump connected to it, you really, you really don't have water. Look, when I went, look, I mean, it, it's something, like the fact that I raise it with the taxi driver, is the fact that it is real. Look, I remember when I was there last year, November, right? I actually took such, what do you want to look at that here for? I don't know, laugh, right? like pleasure. Or just the comfort and knowing that they could get a shower. Right, because when I left Trinidad for that whole week, it didn't have water. Right, so I was kind of glad that I left the house because it means it's one person using water less than right. But I took the opportunity in the hotel then to shower because I'm, this is like a really good shower. Because other than that, you just jump in and jump out, as they say. But really, 
the, the fact that, you know, it, it sounds, it may sound weird to you all, but the reality in Trinidad is that that is a luxury that where you could just relax and take a shower and not worry about your water tank going down. It is, I guess in your TikTok videos and I just check up Trinidad and you will see, uh, I saw one this week, right, where one of my, a past student of mine, he's showing how he's exactly he's sound in his tank. His name is Kess, right? Kess on TikTok, he's sound. That's a, the that's a reality for all Trinidad is really where, you know, like that, that, that is, and that's such a weird thing, right? Because, so like when they say use water less, we can't do that. We, we 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 can't do that, right? Minimize our water consumption. Naturally, we can't do that because we hardly have in the first place, right? Anyway, the main techniques are removing particulates from, uh, from I think this is from, I, I know they say from liquids, but really it is from, from sludge. Right or from the sewer system, right? This is this is the main technique for removing particulates. Yes, it's liquids, but it's really like this is like what the water company will do, right? So first of all, the um uh, it's a series of pits. If you think of these as a series of pits, there's removal of the larger solids that flow into the pit. For example, wood, plastic, textiles, textiles by the process of screening. Screening is like a mechanical rake that goes over the pit and takes up the heavy stuff that is in that pit. And that is normally spread out on the land for burning. Well, they normally take it and they incinerate it. From there, the rest of the water. So this is like, um, like I said, the water authority, how they sort of, you know, get rid of, you know, darkly purify water then, right? Removal of grit and uh, larger particles. They put it in a tank. Those tanks are called sedimentation. So like if you were ever... Like if you ever take modern water and you put it in, you know, modern, well, dirt and water and you sort of shake it up and you leave it, you realize the, the mud settles to the bottom or the dirt settles to the bottom and you have different layers of dirtiness, if you want to call it that, get it to the top. And so that's sedimentation, right? So the, from after removing the larger particles, it's put in a tank to settle. It's called a settling tank or a sedimentation tank. They could add a chemical to it, something called alum, well, alum is one of them. And what that is, it results in something called uh, flotation. And what that is really, the, the stuff you add to it, if it's alum, which is like a coagulating agent, right? You see that down here as well too, right? It sort of makes the, 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 the dirt and dust stick together and settle to the bottom of the tank, right? So you do get the top layers being cleaner, right? The... The bottom layer of sediments is actually pumped out as well. And the top layer, the effluent, is sent to filtrate. The filtration is over another tank. And those tanks are packed like with stone or hard particles. There's something called it coke, which is like a like a hard piece of plastic, right? And uh that sort of material, it's kind of analogous to like water flowing in a in a stream right so as the water flows in the stream if there's rocks in the stream the rocks sort of filters out the water so when you send the effluent to the filtration tanks let me try to draw one for you right it's a tank that is sort of packed with i would say stone but it doesn't have to be it could be an artificial thing called coke right so the tank is packed with stone and then the effluent that you got from the sedimentation tank so you pump out the heavier sludge, right? And you put that again to dry on the land. But this sedimentation tank with, with, with pipes then, right? The effluent is sort of released over these tanks. And then these two in here would have been packed nicely. They would have had moss and stuff on them. And they have like good bacterias there too that will sort of eat on any of the sludge, sewage that may be in that water. So the water trickles down here. Sometimes they refer to this as a trickle filter. And, and, and I don't want to say filtration here, but they call it a trickle filter. You could have a series of trickle filter tanks, not just one. It's a series of trickle filter tanks. And when the water comes out through these trickle filter tanks, then it's just a matter to treat it. So they could add a coagulating agent again, let's say down here. So if there's anything fine, any sort of microscopic, you know, uh, dirt or sewage particle that wasn't there, they will add a coagulating agent. The coagulating agent cause them to stick together and they sink. And then this tank now, the last thing you do is actually treat it. 
like for any biological agents, and they could actually chlorinate that water if they want and release it back into the land, or release it back into your water course. Um, in terms of passing, but some of the questions have come, like, like what is the name of the process to remove the larger particles screening? What is the process, you know, to get rid of um, grit and larger particles sedimentation, right? But you could run through this. Of course, like I said, uh, once we are finished, we'll probably give you some time, about a week or so, to kind of start your studies, right? These things have to be studied, you know, for you all to know them anyway, right? Uh, let's, let me check out. What time is it? I haven't been paying attention to the time. Okay, 11.15, right? So let's go, let's go. I don't think we'll finish though, but definitely what that means next week we'll finish, right? This sort of uh, explanation is causing it to go a bit slower. Effects of water pollution, human health, habitat and ecosystem, buildup of toxin, ozone, the sorry, oxygen depletion, and that happens because of the sediments in the water. They call it DO, dissolved oxygen content. Eutrophication, sediments, oil, physical, and chemical damage, right? So um, really the only one to discuss there is what is called eutrophication. So you see the explanation is what takes the time, right? So I'll, I'll have to draw a diagram to help explain that one, right? So for eutrophication, if there is some sort of... Uh, water course, some sort of dam, right? Uh, what happens in the process of eutrophication? Now, this has to do with nitrogen and, and fertilizers as well. That, right, so that's supposed to be the sun up there, right? So nitrogen, fertilizers, and this is a good example of what happens when you have a diffuse source of, 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 um, of pollution. So nitrogen could be applied to crops, right? And of course, when the rain falls, the nitrogen sort of gets into the water course. I'll just put N2 there. Now, nitrogen is good for the crops, right? I remember NPK. NPK is the um, the nutrients needed for plants. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, right? So nitrogen is good for the crops, and that's all good. But what happens when they get washed into like a water course, it will cause like the weeds in this water course to start to grow, right? So it was meant to grow the crops, whatever you're growing, cabbages or whatever, right? But because it's gotten into the water course now, it's going to cause the weeds to start to grow here. And eventually, what they say, the weeds will grow so much because they have so much nitrogen. And what it's going to do is going to cover the layer of the water. I don't know if you all have ever seen that on a dam or a pond or a river or a lake, right? So that has been covered with weeds, right? Covered with vegetation now, right? Now, when that happens, you may say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, the number one thing is, well, nobody really want that weed there, right? But the other thing is that the sun rays now cannot go down there, right? So remember plants, you know, there are plants in the water here as well. You may have crab, you know, uh, snail, mollusks, right, inside there. So the plants here, now remember plants go through the process of photosynthesis. I know this is a long explanation, right? But the thing is, is now plants need sunlight then, right? So the plants down here, cannot photosynthesize them, right? For those of us who know what photosynthesis is, it's the process by which plants make oxygen then, right? So if the plants don't get the sunlight, right, then they cannot make, make oxygen. Therefore, these organisms here, the fishes, right, the freshwater fishes, whatever that need oxygen, right? And the plants themselves cannot survive. And then what is results? And it results in like a stagnant, ecosystem there, right? And, and what has to happen, if you have seen this, if this was an active sort of a pond or lake, you'll see like the ministry, I think it's the Ministry of Agriculture, they'll have like workers coming to try to remove this vegetation. But the thing is, it grows back. If, if that pond has been diffused with nitrogen, it's just going to grow back, right? And that, that, that whole process there of the pond becoming stagnant based on a lack of oxygen or the plants down here not getting the sunlight when it process of photosynthesis. That process is called eutrophication. Yes, it's a long explanation. But like I say, this is a very good course and I'll tell you this course covers a lot of stuff that um you know that if, if you had to move on to a degree in health and can I just yes, chip in here a little bit? But yeah, according sure. to this eutrophication, right? Where we are doing our, um, it was our 
complex right now for Exxon. That area was a Gaisuku land where they have several canals. And because of the use of the fertilizer, fertilizers on the canes, it became and it started to wash down in the drain from rainfalls and all of that. So the weeds um, grow largely in the, in the canals. However, in that case, um, when we had to like remove those weed, what we found larger species of um, caimans, um, huge snakes and all of these things. There were not um, many fishes, but there were like these type of uh, replies that we found. Um, yeah. And we had to somehow have the wildlife authorities to come in and try to remove how much they can remove from yeah. those canals. But um, is there any, my question to that, is there any way this um, stems growth in terms of the reptile sizes? In terms of the reptile size? Yes, yes, growth. I, I don't think, I think reptiles just grow any way that they could find. A reptile will find its way there, uh, you know, and it will still become very large. I'm not too sure where they get any food from, though, but they become very, very large in, in, in conditions like that. Definitely yeah. right. Keyman, because they Keyman's... were they were under under the growth of those weeds yeah. that grew over yeah. largely. Yeah. Yeah. But caimans tend to caimans move around a lot. Eh? Like they like that may be the place of abode, but they move around a lot. I'm not too sure what they eat, but they love conditions like that. I mean, they love that kind of condition. But like a natural ecosystem of fishes and stuff, you're not gonna really find that anyway, right? Mm -hmm. All right, let me see what I could do here again. Um, I'll probably just, once this topic change, I'll stop and I'll probably just emphasize on a couple of passives, right? Um, so practice question, right? Which is an example of a diffuse source of water pollution? The discharge from a sewage treatment plant, no. Diffuse mean it seeping into the soil and just getting all about, right? And oil spill getting into the draining system, no. High water consumption, definitely not. Runoff from the application of nitrate fertilizers to a cereal crop getting into the local river. Yes, question three is D. So I think, I think I'll stop and go back and re-emphasize on some questions, right? There's actually one I wanted to emphasize on. Uh, so that means uh, next week, Sunday, Definitely is the last, right? I was hoping to do way much more, but you see, it is not a reading exercise. You see, it's it's you know, if you read, you finish, but it's actually more than that. It's actually you know, explanation, especially when some of you all may not have um, like this one here, waste. Right? I think that's waste have questions in it in every paper, right? Let's go back and look at something, right? There was a question I was, I had said I was, I'll come back to. So hopefully you got this one with. You know, the CO2 is global warming, chloride iron is also depletion, right? There's actually one here. There's actually one. But I mean, this could be one, right? What's the best way of dealing with air pollution, right? Eliminate. If you see eliminate, that's the best one, right? But there's a question here, right? So let me ask the question. I don't know if you want to write, write it down. Um how, how long do we go for this class? I'm trying to remember. Is this class an hour and a half or an hour? Or do we have until 12 o'clock? Do we have until 12? I'm trying to remember myself. You know, I think it's an hour and a half we have, which I means think, I have um, It's an hour and a half. Yeah, oh, wait, now we have time. Shucks, I'll try to go back. Let me just tell you the question here. You know, I'm looking at the thing, I'm thinking, but I put most of the arm. Um, most of the class we have finished at half 11, but I think we go till 12. So we have half an hour again, right? But as our only question, let me let me just uh, give the participant here, right? So they had asked a year, and it's a famous question. Um, which of the following is not a type of air pollution? And they had four answers. So if you want, well, I wouldn't, I would just I wouldn't write it over, I'll just circle four from here, right? Or maybe I should write it, right? So which of the following is not a type of air pollution? So they had, let's put out P there for particulate. I'll just put P. They had uh, odors, right? Uh, I'll just pull in some from here, right? 
So odors, I spell that correct. You had things like dust, uh, I just pull maybe, I don't know, fibers or gases or something, right? So what you're following is not a type of air pollution. This is supposed to be G-S-E-S, -E right? What you're following is not a type of air pollution. Particulates, odors, this is supposed to be dust, or this is supposed to be gases. Which are they following is not a type of air pollution. I have a next slide with this, but I don't know if you want to. Like, if you go to the next slide, there were two slides here. Right, you see odors, particulates. What, what do you think is the answer for this? Yeah, you may just want to unmute the mic if you could. I'll spend a minute and I'll have to realize I have half an hour, then we could push again and see how far we could reach. So anybody have an answer for this? Which is the following is not a type of air pollution. Um, Shalene says D, fiber. Okay, but fiber is a minus? No, fiber. Fiber is not on, no, on the four that I have here. Because remember, it's only four they'll give because it's multiple choice now. So I pull out four. Particulates, odors, dust. I think odors. Right. So the answer is actually odors, right? And the reason for that is that when you really look at the other slide, just take a note of it, right? A lot of people have gotten it wrong. But as I remember, tell her to come back and tell you that one anyway. Um, so when you look at odors, you say odors is used in relation to the types of air pollution, but it's not a type of air pollution in itself. So that's just to be technically correct, right? So odors are used in relation to the types of air pollution, but in itself, it's not a category of air pollution there, right? Okay, so no need to explain that already answer. Let me go back. As I have realized, we have a half an hour again, right? Um, so I'm going back to noise then, right? It isn't, no, noise is not, too bad anyway, right? And when we reach hazardous substance, we'll slow down for another question here, right? Um, let's try to push it off and see. So sources of environmental noise, um, think about occasions when you have been disturbed by noise, write down the sources of the noise that trouble you. Now, there's a tricky noise question. You're going to have to just judge it based on what they say. There's a tricky noise question they bring. They sort of tie up that noise question, right? Like, I'll, I'll tell you just now. Sources of environmental noise includes residential neighbors, commercial premises, transport, construction sites, heavy industry, agriculture. Does your organization create noise in the environment? Has your organization ever had any complaints about noise? Right? Let me try to get into this a bit. Um, you, 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 like for that person, it doesn't pay attention. I, I, I'll, I'll come back and I'll describe it here. Like, like uh, it's based on how they ask the question because from sitting to sitting, the answer does change. I'll explain it here in a bit just now, right? Control of environmental noise. Stop or reduce the source of the noise. For example, replacing noisy equipment with a quieter alternative. Placing the equipment in a soundproof enclosure. Limit the transmission of the noise, for example, by a physical barrier. That's a very good control as well. Uh, protect the receiver from the noise by a combination of management controls. So management controls is things like uh, job rotation. So if there is a noisy part of the company, you might not want to work there for the eight hours then. So they may say, okay, four hours, and then you can go down with four hours at this generator room, and then the rest of the day, the other four hours, you can get to the other part of the warehouse, and then they switch the workers around, right? Um, management controls also include things like, uh, if you know what a noise, I mean, sorry, a noise haven may fall as engineering controls, right? So anyway, engineering controls may be things like uh, some proof enclosures. Air muffs. Right? Um, say it again. Air muffs. Air muffs. Air muffs, based on it, they may put air muffs on the PPE. But if you don't have an option of PPE, I guess you can have, yeah, if you have a really good air muff, it could fall under engineering control, right? Um, so management controls, as it was on the slide, include reducing your hours working around a noisy machine, uh, making sure the equipment, when they say sound equipment, uh, they're making sure the equipment is well serviced. So make sure the 
the belt or the pulley on the generator is tightened. Make sure the generator is lubricated. Make sure if there is a, a protective covering wherever you have a pulley, which is two things, you know, moving. Make sure that's well fastened. Vehicle routes, again, if the vehicle routes are close to your office, maybe you could have the vehicles rerouted, right? Where every truck or every vehicle that comes in and doesn't come into your office. And again, that may just mean maybe another management control is probably moving your office. I've actually seen this one. Maybe there's a stock room upstairs and nobody is there. But get get like get that stock room cleaned out and put the stocks downstairs and put your office upstairs, right? Engineering controls include isolation, silencers or mufflers being added on to the, you know, if there's a pipe where you could actually add on a muffler, right? You can do that. Damping. Damping is not what you think, right? Damping. Damping I'm not to do with water. Damping is like a mountain, a, a, what we call a gasket or a covering over the machine. And I might need to describe that here, right? Let me try to draw one. So, if there or, is, or um, it could be um damping could always it could be um like how you have those um I know for sure on the boats we have dampers and those yeah. are like some things like um what you call like louvers things but it it closes off the noise so that you yeah. cannot hear the noise like a shutter. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, yeah. Like the true like damping has like the way to put your damping is if you see like a mus like a musician and the musician hits the cymbal you know it, it makes a sound right so the you know but damping is like if you put your finger on it right so like you hit yeah yeah so so the music so the, like the drummer the musician hits the cymbal but then they hold it right so it creates a song when you hold it that comes like damping so damping is like that whatever is creating is sound if you can put like a like a uh like i'm trying to say like a gasket, not even gasket as you would have in mind, but a covering as it may be like a piece of metal like this, it may be like a metal surface striking another metal surface. But that thing is if you kind of mount like a rubber mount here on it there, right? So you mount a rubber an mount. Insulation, something yeah, like, like something an like insulation. insulation. Yeah. Um, for some machines, it could be just like a coating, right? And it's dampened. So that's the idea of dampened, right? Um. Again, that may have to be based on the machine that you are using anyway, right? Um, yeah, proper maintenance, absorption, and insulation. Again, are other alternatives there for engineering control, right? Um, again, this is multiple choices. Not as if they're going to ask you what is damping, right? But if, you know, like they will say, which of the following is an engineering control? You see hours of work, you see silences, you see it damping. Well, good, you know, damping is the engineering control anyway, right? Um, let me cut the mark out to go. You know, I told you all right, like um, there's actually a diploma in environmental management from Nibosh. This course would have get, gotten you straight into it. A lot of people look at the course though, and they say, well, it's a short course, it doesn't have, but it has a lot of content. If I was to slow down and explain everything here for you all, you all just ready to write the degree exam. That's what, that this, this course is a very good course for that, right? I told you all like last week when or the week before when we did. Aspect and impact. That's like the first degree question you get in. The first question is always asked is what is the difference between aspect and impact? Of course, what is the cause and what is the effect? If you if you forgot it, right? All right. The impact of environmental noise. So the perception of noise can be subjective. Factors affecting noise perception includes loudness, pitch, frequency, background levels, and your like like your likeness. Then, like if you play loud music, as we all do. That to you is music, but for some other person, that is noise, right? So the perception of noise can be subjective, especially in the Caribbean and maybe in also in South America. Neighbors tend to do it a lot. To them, it's, it's nice music, but to the other residents, they can't sleep, right? The most effective way to reduce environmental noise is, let's see if we can find the answer, install double glazing, which is like the dampening thing. Stop the source of the noise. Use air defenders, el sorry, limit hours of working, which is the best way, the most effective way to reduce environmental noise. All of these correct, but which is the best way, the most effective way? B. The answer is B. Stop the source of the noise. Remember, you always go with the idea of eliminate, minimize, 
render harmless. Even though it's noise, we're talking about that study hierarchy. All right, finally, on to waste. Oh, sorry, I was going to tell you the noise question. So here what they have done, and I really can't describe everyone for you, but different students, they kind of give you like a, a small scenario about three lines, and then they be careful. They ask, so what is the most common source of noise? But it comes from here. But like they change this kind of scenario, you know, like one sitting it had, like what is the most common source of noise? And they described something like a hotel, right? So, you know, like if they say it was like a hotel set, and then it, it can't be construction sites, right? So I think for something like that, it, it may be like residential neighbors. It's, it's a kind of tricky question because they change it up a bit, right? Then another setting. But you didn't read it because they kind of sell it out in that short description, right? Like, what is the most common source of noise? Um, you know, and they would describe something like a construction site, right? Or where it have work going on, heavy equipment. So then you know it's construction site, right? But they change it up a bit. And if you want to kind of take a note of that, this slide is important. But they may change something in how they ask the question. If you want, I can show you something in the book. Are we still down here for a reason? And the reason is a password book. But then again, it's not a guarantee that it will come back the same way. So yeah, then be careful because the answer for one might be the answer for another one, right? If you can find this in the book, I'll show you what it did here. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Um, page 63. So like they're going into this then, they're going into what you're looking at on page 63, like residential neighbors, right? I'm reading that one. Environmental noise is most likely to disturb people in their own homes. It often comes from the activities of other residents in the neighborhood. Sources of noise that may cause annoyance include loud music from radios. If you say that loud music from radios, but then you know it's, it's residential noise, right? Dogs barking persistently or late at night. Folks, that one came for a question, right? But you should know then it's, sorry, I went out of the slide. You should know it's residential neighbors then, but then it have, what would it have? It have, you know, like if we go to commercial, it have, it have their commercial premises such as nightclubs and warehouses that are situated in residential areas may also be the source of environmental noise. So then if, if they give you that inclination in the three lines that, what they're talking about is like a club, then the answer you have to say is commercial premises. You understand this question, folks? They change it up a bit, right? Let's go down to transport. If you talk about engine noise from motorways, right? Can travel hundreds of meters at night. We often hear traffic noise from roads, which is very common in Guyana, that are several miles away. Then, then if they say that in the three lines then, or two and a half lines, then you know it's transport. So do you understand the question? When I was at Guyana in, in March, I just think getting used to <laughs> the traffic from the noise. I know Anne, Anne, Anne lives almost where I stayed anyway, right? Um, so in, in March, I'd stayed at, at, at the Status Hotel. That place was noisy. And I don't even have to do it how the status room was, was at me made. But I had to get used to it. I mean, like where I live, it's, it's like you can hear my background. I don't really have any cars inside here. I can show you also my window. Let me show you also my window. Right? Like I don't have any cars, right? Let's see, hopefully. Yeah, so that's like my village, right? So, like, I am not used to the uh, the constant honking of the horn, and I'm not too sure why. I think I've realized I can Guyana, like, there's no right to win. So you, you kind of just blow the horn because you come in through now and you want the other person to know, right? E like, even if you don't have the right to win, like, you just blow the horn and you, you just come through. But I was, that, that, that I've heard other lecturers too, right? Ms. Barbara have mentioned to me there's another lecturer who he, he actually checked out of the status because he couldn't deal with the noise, right? But the last time I was there, which was which was this month, I stayed at I stayed at another hotel. And of course, I know where that is as well. And of course, Shailene probably knew where it is as well because Shailene came and met me there. 
And that was in the same street, but Ahuta was real quiet. I, I didn't get a noise issue at all. And that's because, like I said, I'm accustomed to, you know, like just a quiet village anyway. Like we don't really hear much. And you all saw the road, right? You saw the road, folks. There's no cars on it, right? Um, but that's just my thing anyway. But it was the same street in Guyana, just a different a difference in Huta. It's the same street. They're just walking distance from each other. One of them was quieter than the other one. Anyway, the point is here that, yeah, uh, traffic noise and stuff, you know, is a cause of noise pollution. And I guess if they mention that, um, the point I may want to say again is that you may want to kind of have an idea of page 63. And uh, you may want to kind of learn something from there. Um, you know, transport then. If, if they say then, traffic noise, some um, roads, that are several miles away. And this was just right next to it. Then you know the main source of that noise is transport, right? So they changed the question based on what they described anyway, right? So just be careful of that. Pay attention to page 63 a bit. You will get, that's probably the most common noise question as well as how to deal with noise. All right, 11.40, so we're going on. Um, types of waste. I'll read a bit on, a, this one have the passive by it too, right? So waste are often classified as household waste, commercial waste, municipal waste, construction waste, industrial waste, agricultural waste, food waste. That is actually not, that's actually not the main classification. I'll tell you the main classification. Well, let me slide tell you in a bit. And this is it, right? So the main types of classification of waste, there are the, the three categories. You have hazardous, you have non-hazardous, and you have inert. That's the three main classification of waste, right? So anything that has all of these properties, if you just read this, is explosive, it's reactive, it's corrosive, it's toxic, it's biologically hazardous, it's toxic to the environment, that means it is hazardous, right? All of these is hazardous, right? See, you cannot read something like toxic and say that is non-hazardous. You cannot read something like corrosive and say that's non-hazardous, right? So hazardous is anything that is bad. Right? Um, all of this is hazardous, right? Clinical waste, radioactive waste, hazardous. Right? For the exam, they will stick to the categories hazardous, non hazardous, inert, right? Clinical and radioactive waste, the, all of these are different categories of hazardous waste, right? Hazardous, right? So non hazardous. So, what is non hazardous now? So, non hazardous waste are those with no hazardous properties, right? But non hazardous waste, can still impact the environment. So non-hazardous waste is things like uh, paper, cardboard, vegetable peeling, you know, uh, you know, domestic waste, once it's not plastic, right? Uh, so that's non-hazardous waste, right? So the, the other one though is inert waste. I think we had to go to the book to watch that one, right? So inert waste, if you want to take a note, inert waste, they don't have much on the team. Inert waste, but you need to know what it is, right? So inert waste is waste that is neither hazardous nor non-hazardous. The word inert sort of means it's not doing anything. It's not doing anybody anything. It's just there, right? So inert waste is like a good example they, they have here is like a brick, like a construction brick there, all right? A brick for your homes. It's just there, it's just sitting on the on the land, but it's not doing anything. It's not it's not biodegraded, at least not in a couple of years, may take 50, 60 years anyway, with weather impact, right? But inert waste is waste that is just there, like a clean glass bottle is inert waste. It's not really affecting the environment, it's glass, right? So an, an intact clean glass bottle is inert. It doesn't degrade and it doesn't do anything. It doesn't contribute to water pollution or nothing like that. It's a glass bottle, it's glass, right? It doesn't do anything. So that is an example of inert waste, right? So they ask that every year, and I have a question here, so we can go straight to 10, right? Which is an uh, example. Just before you go to your question, inert waste can be a um, pieces of wood or something too. Because it's of? not harmful. for to the environment wood but if it's wood it may degrade it, it may biodegrade so then it may be classed as non-hazardous non-hazardous because it's okay. degraded right but glass wouldn't degrade then you know like 
All right. Glass will, yeah. So if it's if it's decomposable, then I think it could be non-hazardous. But if it's just there, like a like a brick there could be for 50 years on your land. The brick are going anywhere unless if somebody move it or somebody take it, right? But it's not doing anything. And like a glass bottle on your land there, uh, nothing really happening to it. It's not interacting with anything, it's just there. But anyway, too, they'll change this question. Let me do let's just do this one and then I'll, I'll tell you how they just change it, right? So, which is an example of inert waste? Um, clean bricks from a demolition site. Grass cuttings, glass butter that have been used to hold chemicals, cardboard. So we can put this into the category, but I might I'm trying to pull the marker if I write it, right? So clean bricks from the demolition site. This is inert. So this is the answer. Grass cutting is non-hazardous. It will, it will decompose then, right? Non-hazardous. Glass bottles that have been used to hold chemicals is hazardous because they say it used to hold chemicals, right? And cardboard will be non-hazardous, right? So the reason why I did it like this is because, again, folks, it has changed this question, right? Like in the next sitting, they will ask, which of the following is hazardous? The answer would then be C, right? Then the next sitting, they ask, which of the following is non-hazardous? Well, they don't have to clean up this answer. I'm just kind of making up a question, right? They'll have to give any one that is non-hazardous, which it may just have one, which would be like grass cuttings, right? Uh, let me tell you how I've seen them change this. So I've seen them, what they did a year, they didn't give the option of bricks, right? But they said the glass bottles were clean instead, right? So for inert, they said glass bottles, like clean glass bottles then, right? So then, then that set in, the clean glass bottles would have been the inert one. They would have removed, I think, maybe bricks and they had another answer there, right? So I think you understand it's a bit hazardous as anything that is bad. Toxic, corrosive, flammable, you know, irritant. Any what it sounds bad is actually hazardous. Once it have chemicals, any chemical is bad is hazardous, right? Non-hazardous, you could think of it as anything that could rot then or biodegrade. Cardboard, paper, glass, sorry, not glass, grass cuttings will be non-hazardous. And if the waste is just there, like it's not doing anybody anything, it's class as in it. But you have to look out for it because. Like one of the words that sell this one out is the word clean, clean, right? Because if they had said bricks that was taken out from, I'm making something up, right? Like from a refinery or from an oil catchment, it means it have oil in it, right? So then bricks now would not be the answer. So the key word here is clean. And then that other city that had clean glass bottles and they would have left on this whole part here, that city then, the, the inert one would have been the glass bottles. Yeah, multiple choice is designed to trick you. But, you know, like I said, I kind of leading you all in the right direction. Hopefully you all play over the video and listen to it. And just have your head on, right? Uh, to pass, like I said, it's 20 questions. You have to get 12 correct. 12 questions correct. Most people get way more than that. 12 equates to 60%. Most people end up in the six, sorry, the 70s and the 80% percentage here with this exam anyway, right? You know, like I've, I've told you all before, like I cannot do this qualification. I like this qualification. I brought this to the region and now the year was 2014. That's almost 10 years ago now, right? I think we're the only provider for this. I know in Trinidad, I don't think anybody in Guyana has this qualification, but um, like, I love these qualifications, but because I have the license, I can't do it, you know? So that's the kind of sad, but I do have the license. So my name is on the license, a Shadrach Safety Institute, but I myself personally, I cannot. These are such nice, I refer to them as Sunday courses. The companies refer to them as low hanging fruits. But uh, I guess maybe when I retire, what do you all think <laughs> when I retire? Right, I'll go and get these things done. But I myself, like I am the one who brought this here now, right? So I cannot do it. So I personally don't have this certificate. I have my degree in environmental engineering, but you know, it'd be nice to have these things. So you all, I normally have my students end up having more personal certificates than me, especially when I bring a course to the region and I 
I'm the only one banned from doing it anyway. Right? But it's such a nice one. I I I would love maybe when I retire soon, whenever. Right? I can probably get there. But I don't know what I'll do with them then. But it's such a nice qualification to have, right? We have 10 minutes. Let me kind of get into waste management. Um, I think this was the passiper right here. So I guess waste management. Oh, there's a question here too. We can walk all the way down here. We can probably stop. Well, I can just go to the question, eh? but we can probably stop. Let me see. All of this is, we can stop at this question, practice question, right? But if I tell you the answer, if I tell you what you're going to test, we can go straight to that question, right? So waste management, yes, there's another question here. Um, so waste management is a big challenge facing industrial industrialized societies and it's big money too if you could solve the waste problem. A lot of people are doing it, a lot of locals, a lot of uh, artists, a lot of persons, uh, uh, Amazon is doing it, Samsung is doing it, a lot of big companies are getting into the recycling business. If you purchase anything from Amazon, Samsung, the packages that it, it comes in is actually recycled material. There's actually a big boast on that Samsung or, or, or Amazon will tell you that the package that you got your stuff in was made from recycled material, right? Um, waste incident, waste incident, waste, sorry, not waste, waste creation can have high costs, payment for raw materials. Some may go to waste, payment for waste to be collected and disposed of. And if you are in the waste sort of, um, you know, remedial business. There's a lot of money to be made at the moment, right? Um, so the waste hierarchy, prevent, reduce, reuse, recover, disposal. I'll try to read and I'll come back and I'll tell you, right? Prevent, we avoid the waste problems by creating no waste. Don't waste raw materials during manufacture. Uh, good quality control will ensure that fewer rejects are produced. Don't throw away your mobile phone every time a new model comes out. Reduce, use less materials, uh, means less waste created. Make the same product, but with less materials. Example, food tins and drink bottles are now much thinner and lighter than they used to be. When carrying out any tasks such as painting a building, calculate the correct amount of material paint needed to complete the job. This avoids buying surplus material, which needs to be disposed of when the job is finished. Right, And of course, you all know the uh, Coca-Cola company, um, you know, they have... Like if you compare a bottle of Coke today compared to the eighties, nineties, um, you know it's it's much thinner, right? With the shape of it, of course, as compared to the bottles we would have had back in the day, and um, you know they actually put like the Disani bottle, uh, uh, they it's actually on the bottle itself that there's a certain percentage of it made with, um. I think it's disposable materials or biodegradable materials. So a Desani bottle would actually biodegrade, unlike a pure plastic bottle then, right? So a lot of the companies, this is the solution to the problem. The solution to the, this problem is that customers, consumers, you and I, if we have the option, regulators then, right? If we have the option to purchase a drink that's in a biodegradable bottle or biodegradable uh, container, then we will do that. But if the if, if what is available is not good for the environment, then, then you find the population, but they'll be like they would use what is given to them. They would, they would buy the coke in the bottle that does the green, right? And I think I saw in Guyana when I was there, I think I saw a lot of the food boxes uh is actually biodegradable. We have that in the Caribbean as well. We have it in Tobago where Plastics is actually banned on the island of Tobago. I'm pretty sure it's probably banned in Grenada and Barbados as well, right? So you get your box, and I think I got this in Guyana too, but the box is not plastic then. It, it looks like plastic. It probably feels like plastic, but it's actually biodegradable, right? So a lot of the solution to the problem is actually manufacturers putting out a safer product on the market. So we, the consumers, would actually purchase, because that's what we do. Remember, we, we actually consume but if what is put out for us is, is safer and better for the environment, well, then better for us as well. Reduce um, less materials means less waste created. Make the same product, but with less materials, food tins and drink wrap bottles are not much thinner and lighter than they used to be, right? So that's where we that open. 
Many companies now donate their redundant IT equipment, such as PCs and laptops, the education establishment and the charities, an enormous range of goods such as clothes, pitiers, furniture, cooking utensils and books are donated to charity shops. This is a major source of income for many charities as well as cheap source and the cheap source of goods for many people. Another growth area for passing on unwanted items for reuse by both, sorry, by others is the use of online auction sites. I love those. I love those when I go to London. I love auctions. I love printed stuff, right? And so I know two um, companies have a lot of recycling drives and donation to charities. I know, um, you know, some some close colleagues of mine and, and friends of mine that donate to charities. I do it myself, but I know a lot of people, but I know one particular person that does, you know, um, donate to like clothes then, right? And really good clothes. It's not, it's not old clothes, but really good clothes to charities uh, for children, right? And that's a really good idea that a company is could have been getting to that anyway, right? So I think um, I'll kind of stop here and just tell the exam question, all right? So recovery, anyway, recovery is the same as recycling. So if, if you look at the hierarchy, they didn't say recycle, but they said recover. But if you read recover, recover is recycling. See if you see that there, recover is recycling. Recover is recycling. There's a reason for that more than once, right? And then the last one is disposal. This should be the last resort, and the disposal here is not, you know, to throw it out the window. The disposal they're talking about is a sanitary landfill. Yeah, there's actually such a thing. There's actually a landfill that they can actually have it in a way that they have the way to incinerate on the landfill, and they have the way to deal with, like, um, taking all the plastics, getting them recycled, and whatever. Have. It's called a sanitary landfill, right? Not a dump. So there's a difference between a sanitary landfill and a dump. I mean, just to tell you here, as I have the, the couple of minutes, a sanitary landfill is a space of land, but it will have, they will actually put things in it then. You have like incinerating chambers, right? The sanitary landfill, the base of it is going to be concrete so nothing could get into the, the, the earth's, you know, water table then, right? Um, so you can look them up. I don't know if there's any in the region here. You have, you know, around the developed countries, there's a sanitary landfill. They will take a certain amount of uh, waste and some will be recycled. The non-hazardous properties will be incinerated and these incinerators have filters and stuff on them to ensure that what gets back to the atmosphere is very good. Again, this is good business, folks. I know of a company um, that is in my old hometown where, where I grew up that did this, right? They, they I think everything is actually important. So I think the whole plant is movable. But they set up like a, 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 a like an incineration area, or should I say, location where hazardous waste could be treated. So they get lots of money from the the companies in Trinidad because the companies take pride in and selling you know materials here. Of course, they pay for that. They pay this company for that, and the company bioremediates them and incinerates them and deals with that waste. Then and that company is in the millions of dollars, right? So that's a good business plan, you know, to sort of deal with waste on an industrial level, right? And I know the we have, we have landfill here. We have we do segregation of waste, hazardous, non-hazardous in our wastes. So we have a we call the landfill here. We also have, have that system how we operate here. Why I, I commend you all, you know here's a shake of my because of Trinidad has been in the oil and gas industry for years, right? But how I describe getting into port of Spain to oil, we don't have a sanitary landfill. We have a dump, right? This company, this is a private company. This is not the government. This is a private company, right? It's called EcoSol, right? This is a private company. But like how we get rid of like all the garbage that's collected in from the homes, it just gets on a dump. And you have people that go in the dump and they take stuff and the the, the, the boys and them go and take all the metal strip, maybe television sets and whatever. That's how it is here. Right? And uh, you know, it's not it's not properly managed. And the thing is, like I said, Trinidad has been in the oil and gas industry for, you know, I mean, 60s, 70s, 
and there's been no such grand infrastructure there, right? This is a private kind of US-based company that set up in the village that I grew up in, not here. This is, the, I, I, I didn't grow up in this village here, right? I grew up south of the island, south, south, south of the island, right? Um, there's actually a beach there called Los, Los Iros Beach. From that beach, you can actually see Venezuela. There are many places in Trinidad you can see the landmass of Venezuela. I remember being there one time and a guy in his ship had actually run aground on that beach, right? I didn't, if anybody remember that. I actually went on the ship, I thought nobody, I thought somebody had murdered somebody or something, right? And I was on the beach. I scaled up like a pirate through the rope and I went up in the ship. And then later on in the news that day, they said there was a guy in his vessel that um that was a fishing vessel, right? A fishing tug or whatever, right? That got that got grounded on that beach. So they tell you how short it is, like the distance between, you know, Trinidad, Venezuela, guy, and there's actually that short anyway. Folks, I'll stop here, but I want to tell you the exam question. It's 12 o'clock, right? So here the next exam question. If it didn't figure it out yet, the next ex exam question is this, right? Trying to change it. The next exam question is the hierarchy of control. Yes, the hierarchy of control. This year, you have to learn this. You have to learn this, right? So prevent, reduce, reuse, recover, dispose of comes in every sitting. Hear what they ask, right? And of course, it's not one question, but I'll give you the format of the question, right? There's that which is the best option. Right? And could I ask one, right? So if I was to ask, what is the best option between recycling, reducing, reusing, and disposal? What is the best option between, here, here was I said, recycling, reducing, reusing, and disposal? What is the best option? Recycling, reduce, Reuse, disposal, I pick four. And I said recycling because that's what they may say, it, right? But what is the best option? Let me get a rule in the meantime. Anybody want to give it a try? Try, a try, a try. What's the best option? I would say reuse. Right. Which one? Reuse or? Reuse, you could reuse or you could reduce the type of material that the product is made with yeah. so that you don't have less, uh, much to dispose of, but everything could be utilized. Yeah. Anybody else? Let me just take up my fan. I feel like I'm Put on the fan of these. Okay. I think I'll answer when yes. So here, here's the answer, right? Let me just check this one answer for you all. So that's why you have to learn the hierarchy, right? Um, Ijaz, Ijaz, Salara, what, what did what did you just say? So reduce, reuse. Um, yeah, so, no, reduce and or reuse. Yeah, but you, you could only choose one. Oh, uh, well, um, I think I'll go ahead and reduce it. Right, so the answer is reduce. So that's the catch, yeah. right? So the hierarchy, the, the word hierarchy, Means they, you see, if you watch the arrowhead, means up here is the best option. So, actually, between reducing and recycling, reducing is best. But a lot of students will go and put recycling because, you know, recycling is like on everybody's mind now, right? But you had to give the answer based on the hierarchy, right? Here, 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 next trick, right? Here, next trick. Mama telling you trick questions, I tell you any questions could come, right? In some settings, they would say, they just mix up the order. So here, what do you say, right? That doesn't tell you how to learn this hierarchy. They would say reuse is the second option in the hierarchy of control. And that's wrong. Reuse is not second, reuse is third. Here, next one. Here, I'll give you a whole set. So I hope you can play back the recording, right? And next one. Recover or recycle it is the best option. And a lot of students put yes, and they get wrong. Recycling is not the best option. Preventing is the best option. When you read that, if anybody here do listen to this video, then you will get it wrong. Because it sounds correct. Okay? Recycling is the best option. And yeah, we put that correct, but you get it wrong. Right? Recycling is not the best option. Recycling is the, well, is, I mean, it's not 
one, two, three, four is the fourth upshot, right? Then they just switch it to, they will say disposal is the second upshot in the hierarchy of control. No, disposal is not second, disposal is last. Let me see if I find a question here to prove that to you all. I think there was one hiding somewhere. Okay, look at that one here. I think this could be one, right? Number six. I know it after 12. I'm hungry too, but I don't normally eat. No, I need it for a right? So which would be which would be the preferred method for dealing with empty cardboard boxes used to deliver paper to an office? Which would be the preferred method for dealing with empty cardboard boxes? Everybody go and put re everybody can put recycle, right? But recycling is not the best, right? Empty cardboard boxes used to deliver paper to an office. Burn it. Yeah, they keep the hierarchy in mind. Burn it, right? Collection by the local authority for landfill disposal. Now, that can't be the best because that's the last option. Disposal is the last one, right? Collection by the local authority for recycling. And then reuse the boxes. So which is the best one? B. Reuse the boxes. So D, yeah. D is the answer. But you see the trick? You see the trick, right? And I tell you the trick. Now, this is the thing about Nibosh. If you could figure the trick, the paper does be an easy question. So reuse is on top of recycle. Reuse is better than recycling, right? So like I said, I've taught you all, but I've also taught you all how the questions could come. You can't fail unless you didn't listen to what we tell you in class, right? I'm going to stop here. Um, Those of us who may be looking at this, because I realize these videos, for some strange reason, get a lot of views. We only have five or four people in class, and... Some of my videos, you know, would they, they get thousands of views and that, that can't be Trinidadians or Guyanese. So if anybody is on the worldwide system listening to this, uh, we'll have our last part next week, Sunday. Um, what we'll do, right? You see, we almost finish, right? We are on 63 slides. We almost finish, right? We almost finish. So what we'll do, that's about 15 slides, right? I'll run through that. And next week, I'll, I'll have a pass paper here. So when we finish, we'll take our pass paper from number one, to number 20 and we'll try to get it done. What 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 y'all think, right? So next week will be the last class. We we'll wrap up this this couple of slides here and we'll turn it into a past paper session anyway, from number one to number 20, right? Um Shalane Ejaz, I call it the rule by the way, Shalane Ejaz. Uh, That's right. Amrish Amrish is a Anyway, I'll tell them about them another day, right? And Nikisia Miss. I'm gonna once the once the video is finished, did I stop the recording? Once it finished, um when once the video, no, I didn't. <laughs>